and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good sister to the temple. Some of you may know her as, as the as the evil genius behind Soulbound, the actual Soulbound. And uh, and now is coming back with Between Clouds, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only the soul the soul mother herself, Miss Andy Licht. How you doing tonight? Hey Mildred, thanks for the big intro. <laughs> wow. Okay, all my accolades right before me. Hey. <laughs> Well, not all of them. I only, I only have so, I only have so much time, and I'm not, and um, I'm not dre I'm not dressed like a town crier. This is okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me know next time. I'll bring a guitar and a lute, and we can do the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Now, I've, now I've got the flying V stuck in the back of my head. Oh, Figuratively, no. not literally. I mean, hey, throw it in. Good sound bite. Why not? Just re just remember, the wa the um the Wayne's World rule applies. Absolutely no stairway. Mm 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 mm. Some things are off limits. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you sh I know I do the humble beginnings of of sorts, but that that'd be redundant in this case. So I'll put that in the redundancy department of redundant, and mm -hmm. instead start off with. How this particular idea came about. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, between clouds, mm -hmm. the idea uh, is that you and your friends, the players in this tabletop role-playing game, travel about atop a, a, a massive flying creature mm -hmm. akin to, you know, the, the most common references like Appa from Avatar The Last Airbender, but I mean also Falcor, Never Ending Story, uh, The Last Guardian by um, Aiko, which came out a while back. There's a few cultural references here and there. I mean, that's the core concept, the main pitch. How did the idea come about? You know, that's a great question. I think I, think I, I, think I may have been watching Avatar, something of the sort. I guess why, why it interested me so much when the the idea first came to me is because as a for tabletop role playing games right i feel like a common issue is unity and cohesion making sure all of the players are in the same place at the same time um you know like with a with a shared objective direction it's, it's very easy for players to go off and do their things or say, well, maybe we wouldn't stick together because we have a difference of opinions or, um, yeah, it can be difficult to unite a party. And I guess what I liked about the idea of everyone riding around on this single thing on this creature is that it, it automatically um, gave a, a sense of cohesion to the game. You know, we're all here for a reason. Like this, this creature is our, our home, right? Um, and this nomadic lifestyle. So, there's no reason that the players wouldn't be together. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you mentioned that, given the rising prevalence of the the concept of session zero, which right. I've been I've been doing for I've been doing for years, even before I found out what that actual term was, because I would always create these um, primers when I would mm -hmm. when I would run one shots at my LGS, mm -hmm. um, where there. Where, as an aside, there was a bit of an un there was a bit of an unwritten rule of when it's your first time coming in, um, bring the guy, bring a sandwich for the guy who runs the place. Oh, sure, sure. Hey, I like that rule. Yeah. Uh, well, sandwich, know. chips, bring me the whole nine yards. Yeah, no, I need more than that. Um, the um, the sub rule for that is if you're gonna bribe the GM, us which is usually me with with something, um, don't bring chocolate. Mm. Um, that's a good. That's a good way to ensure your character gets killed out of spite. Okay, not the expected result from bringing someone chocolate, but I will make a note of that. Very um, well. Chocolate mm -hmm. allergy. That's why. Oh no! You know, sometimes good things just don't like us. Okay. Hmm. Uh, 
but session session zero um yeah se session zero i feel like so many times especially when i'm trying to get a new player into a tabletop game right like they haven't played before but you're trying to establish this cast of characters this party of characters oftentimes you can wind up you know we've all been at a tavern before and it's like oh you see uh you know a cloaked figure or whatever with what color are your eyes blue okay you see a cloaked figure with blue eyes sitting across the way right and it's like <laughs> we need to make these kind of unnecessary formal introductions for the characters but it's like you know i don't know if that's what i'm playing a tabletop game for right I, I, there's so much else to be doing to be exploring and adventuring and and, and all this swashbuckling the introductions aren't always the uh that they can be necessary, but you know, I think for a lot of players, it's not it's not the the sauce, right? That they show up for. So yeah. the the last the last one that I did the last one that I did I've 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 had a habit of doing of doing introductions in Medias Res, and the appro the approach that I the first off the approach with the setting was to try and do, was to was to mix um, modern military with high fantasy. So, th so okay. I went with the idea that they were um, that they were drop troopers. Okay. The reason this is important is because is because after getting a bit of a briefing, then they realized, wait, they're they're in a drop pod. It's go, and I'm literally dropping them in the setting. Mm hmm. I mean, that's fun. You know, I like a I like an introduction with little explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Throw them right in, right? And I've. I have a, I have a, in the same vein, I have a soft spot for the, for, for the way you're, in, for the way, um, you're introduced to, to the, to the action in something like Final Fantasy VII, where it, instead, you have the establishing shot of Midgar, and then it's, and then it's right into, is right into hijacking a train. Uh, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, you know, I mean, we've all, we've all heard of like a whale tale for storytelling before, right? Yeah. Start big. And then dip down, and then you can build back up. But I think, especially in like for tabletop games where players will fall asleep or start browsing their phones, if uh, you know left with nothing to do, yeah, yeah, it, session zero is not not always useful, not always helpful. Mm -hmm. It's I think I think it's I think it's a tool it's a tool on a canvas. There's right ways and wrong and wrong ways to to use it. Um, right. But since but since a, since a lot of people want to get right to the action, I instead of trying to swim up river, I'd rather um swim. I'd rather swim with the current. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it is one of one of the things that one of the things that I that I couldn't help but no I couldn't help but notice is with the color palette of Between Clouds, it's al it's almost a um. A, po a polar opposite to your previous work in Soulbound, mm -hmm. especially with how especially with how br how um, bright everything is. It's mm -hmm. in a weird in a weird roundabout way. I ended up getting reminded of Skies of Arcadia of all things. Which mm -hmm. okay, of, of For, forgive me, pop culture blind spot. What is Skies of Arcadia? Skies of Arcadia in five words or less. Um, it was a video game RPG that was originally a GameCube exclusive. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Bright, well, vibrant, big color palette. Yeah. Th um. That's that's one. Of, that's one. And I'd say I'd say another. I'd say another would prop would probably be the would probably be the anime series Last Exile. Granted, okay. you're going with hmm. you're going with Biopunk and Last Exile was. More, more um, diesel punk, if anything else. But yeah, I would love to. I'd love to talk a little bit about what biopunk uh, means here at some yeah, point that's, too. That's um, kind of what, what I it, to go what it to. could mean. So that's kind of what I wanted to go into next because biopunk is not a road that's often traveled. And no, well, and it's a very, it's a very loosely uh, hewn path. There's, there's, there's very little examples for a right or wrong way to do it, but. I guess on the on the note of the color palette, um, you are you are very correct in your observation. The last game, Soulbound, dark industrial fantasy, uh, was certainly like tonally and artistically supposed to be, you know, more more grim, more drab. 
Um, whereas Between Clouds is vibrant and uh, I am I am literally trying my best as I can as an artist to pack in as much color as possible to each piece of artwork. Like even in places that it doesn't belong, you know, just just so it's there, just so it sh shows up in the book. And um, um, yeah, I think I don't know. I, I I worked on Soulbound for seven years, eight years, right? And so I think tonally, artistically. I was I was just feeling a little burnt out on the whole dark and drab thing, and I think I just needed a change of pace. Um, so I didn't burn myself out, you know, like working on still working on tabletop games, right? But I, you know, you need to try you need to try new things, otherwise you'll you'll kind of lose that spark, lose that inspiration. So yeah, I just went the complete opposite direction and thought, what if we what if we did something fun? What if we did something colorful? So. Makes makes sense, and even even with the even with that emphasis on color, the think the thing that I noticed is that um, colors t colors tied directly or indirectly to blue seems to be the seems to be the key thing. Because even with trying to put as much color in there, um, my monkey brain prefer prefers ha prefers having a all roads lead to Rome approach with hot with um color because. You put too much in, and then you end up with the, with um, a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> well, hey, aesthetically, I wouldn't mind if Jackson Pollock painting is where we landed, but I think I think just because of you know the game, so so the game takes place above the clouds, right mm -hmm. above the surface of this uh, ruined planet, and. I think I think because of that, you know, a, a blue sky. Although I do try to mix it up as often as I can, a blue sky is kind of unavoidable and you know emblematic of the game, right? It's a, it's about the open skies. So I think, yeah, I think that blue gets packed in there pretty often. But yeah, and what I do find what I do find interesting when it comes to the um the character setup with the with the animals that you mentioned. Is the name that mm -hmm. you chose, uh, the Kieran? Kieran, yeah. The reason uh, reason why I find that interesting is because of um, what Kieran are in um, in in East Asian cultures. It's usually it's usually yeah. something that accompanies a sage, or in some in some cases the emperor. Right, the coming of they're meant to be a herald of of good times to come or of a new a new emperor, a new benevolent emperor coming to power. Yeah. And I I did I did choose them so yeah, the the creatures are called Kieran. I chose that name kind of kind of for a, a few reasons. I mean, one aesthetically, right? I I often see Kieran depicted as these um, long, much like, you know, uh, dragons in a lot of Eastern cultures, like, uh, in these long, flowing, serpentine ways, right? With these swooshy tails, and, um, so, so just aesthetically in the way they were built, I was really attracted to that. But also just the, the power and majesty that if you, if you read about, you know, myths of Kirin's, uh, of of Kieran that they are you know these benevolent creatures right that they are here to here to do justice and uh, yeah I thought that was thought that was quite interesting so mm -hmm. a little bit of a little bit of um, sneak peek for what may be to come uh, and also a mythological fact um, there are Kieran up above the clouds that the game centers around but there will also be to what degree depends on stretch goals. Uh, Kelpies in the game. Kelpies being from another part of folklore, I believe Scottish folklore, but them be also being horse-like creatures like Kieran, but rather than uh, flying around, Kelpies live beneath water and are said to shapeshift. So um, you can let your brain wander with that one, but Kelpies will also make a, an appearance in the game, maybe not for, maybe not as a force of good. So... Now, with with that in mind, in I do find it interesting that e even though you ha even though you are doing a whole different set, a whole different setting and a whole different um, energy, <laughs> with but when it came to, when it comes to both, there is still a common theme of marked so of marked souls being different being different from the rank and file. Back that back then it was Correct. the soulbound who. 
were who um were who had who had these abilities but were always going to be on the fringe because of them and mm -hmm. with the symbiotes because of their connection to the to the Kirin and the propaganda about symbiotes um they are they are still they're still on that fr on that fringe just in a different manner they are yeah i uh, you know that that's a good observation. I do. There are definitely a few parts, and for observant folks like yourself, I there are definitely elements from Soulbound that I kind of carried over into this game, or have I have chose to build this world in ways that kind of mirror parts of Soulbound, and um, yeah, and it, it's true. In both in both games, you know, players end up. Or they, they automatically assume the role either as wielders or as symbiotes in Between Clouds. They assume the role of, of an outcast or someone who is not necessarily accepted in society. And I, I do that for two reasons. The first one is because I think it provides some natural tension, some natural animosity, you know? I don't want to make my world building quite so simple as good and evil. And I think it's interesting to, uh, to be othered and to have who who we know are the quote unquote good guys to have them be framed as bad guys in the context of a, of the world right it kind of adds this dynamic this contrast that that makes things interesting from the jump and then the second reason um for transparency and i only kind of started to come to like come to grips with this a bit more recently but as a as a queer person i you know have I've always dealt with othering, with being part of a, uh, being kind of outside of the norm. And yeah, I just thought it'd be fun to kind of like explore that in the game a bit more. So I think maybe that's why my brain naturally gravitated towards it. But yeah, that the, that is a, a common theme, I'd say, for these two games. We'll see if it holds up in the future. But um, when I was when I was testing Soulbound with some of my students... I had I had told I had told them to think I had told them to consider cert, a certain a, a certain archetype of the of the wandering hero, um, and the ex the examples that I use for that kind of thing is the is the cow is the um, fairy tale cowboy, the or or the the Ronin, the um, Cha in in Wuxia, as mm -hmm. well as well as as well as as well as some of the as well as the likes of Solomon Kane. These, pe oh, these people yeah, who I mean come who come in um right right wrongs leave because they because they because for whatever reason they cannot um settle in one place. Right. Yeah, I'm going to pick pick option D, all of the above, absolutely. I mean, I think yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a wandering uh, it's it's a it's a character who um is passing through, but uh, but ultimately as a force for change and hopefully a force for good, you know. So, mm -hmm. and in that in that same vein, the the um ec the extra normal ability in s between but between both games grants cer mm -hmm. granted certain benefits, and I'm guessing that's that's um still going to be the case when it comes to symbiotes. They ha they. Is it the case where they would have certain abilities that, an a that an average human wouldn't? It it is yeah. So the symbiotes um, are bound to their Kirin both in a uh, biological sense. I I should say both in, in a, an emotional spiritual sense, but also in a very real biological sense. Um, the Kirin are these creatures that possess you know the ability to edit and store the genes of other things they're like these genetic pollinators for biodiversity and so when they find a human that they like they connect and um kind of gather their own little symbiotic herd of humans to protect them the kieran are not quite so well equipped to protect themselves on their own against you know the the tools of man right nets and harpoon guns and uh cannons and all these things so they find um humans symbiotes who will protect them and in return they enhance these symbiotes their people with uh powers with biological powers and um yeah that is that is kind of what grants them 
an edge over the over the competition. So yeah, that that is that is what can, they can expect. In in game in specific, they'll get uh, players will get mutations, mm -hmm. which are more of passive physical changes. So they might have uh, beast like eyes or um, pointed ears, scales across their arms, gills on their neck, um, a tail. Uh, so these, you know, two two little horns atop their head. So these small passive changes that'll help them out in game. And then there's powers, which are more of activated biological effects. You know, um, shooting lightning from their hands, growing wings from their back, um, uh, sending a hive of insects uh, swarming from their body to attack their foes. So yeah, the, uh, all of that stems from the Kirin, similar to how in Soulbound players receive their powers from. A weapon it's it's that same theory mm -hmm. so and speaking speaking of that is there is there that same is there a similar level of mix and matchness when it come when it comes to symbiote abilities the way that the way that they're not in not in the exact same way as there was for weapons but in terms of having areas of personalization very much so yeah as in the game's current form it's quite open-ended being that um there, there's a small level of randomization and how how symbiotes gain new powers is by encountering wild kirin it's because the kirin uh you know they act as these pollinators they store all of this information from every creature they've encountered and so when symbiotes encounter a wild kirin um, typically in a situation where they are rescuing it, it it's being hunted by poachers or um, the creatures become lost or contracted an illness, whatever it may be. Uh, when In situations when they're helping a wild Kirin, it in return grants them new powers. And based on the um, type of Kirin that it is, that kind of determines what powers they might get from it. Similar to how in Soulbound players could seek out certain corrupted enemies to gain uh, powers from within that corruption type. So, mm -hmm. now, needless to say, I found some game mechanics I liked, and I uh, am taking my time to kind of refine them and and really learn what I do and do not enjoy about uh, um, what I what I've done in the past. So, mm -hmm. now, with given this relationship between Kirin and symbiotes, uh Especially, especially given the mechanics thing, which I'll get into in a minute, is the is the Kieran as much of a character as the well characters? That is a great question. Um, yes and no. For as for as helpful as that may be, you know, in terms of role play, there's there's only so much that uh, a DM can do, right? creature can't have a conversation but you know it can snarl and wag its tail and prance about and um communicate in its in its own way a kieran a kieran will have its own stats and um players will roll dice for it but there are times when it can't be present when uh you know when players are indoors when they are away from the creature and those times can even you know pose a threat can can be a danger as um as as players can or i should say symbiotes can be supported by their kieran through unity points which i think you're just about to bring up so being being distanced from their kieran can even uh, be troublesome but kieran they are their um they are their own characters in a way they they do each one is randomized for a breed kind of related to a real world mammal cats dogs deer bears horses so on and uh, also randomized with its own personality type. And the personality type affects what skills it's good at. So an aggressive Kirin might be better at um, fighting off enemies, whereas a curious um, uh, a Kirin with a curious personality type might be better at searching an area or following a trail. Um, so the, it affects gameplay as well as just, you know, role play, how the creature might act upon meeting new people, right? Is it going to snarl at them? Or sniff them, or back away and hide in a corner. So they are characters, um, just as much as the storyteller is willing to let them be. Mm -hmm. 
Now, give, given the one, given the wandering nature of a of a game of a game like this, um, there there's one per, there's one particular style of play that used to be used to be fairly common, but as time has passed on, I see I see it less and less unless I'm running it at my own table, and that is hex crawls. And I'm curious, I'm and I'm curious if a game like this could accommodate hex crawls and to a similar to a similar vein um what you have in mind when it comes to travel rules that is a great question and uh you you may be familiar with forbidden lands i am um you are right so you know hex crawls for 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 combat for on the ground interactions I don't see a need for them in a game like this, but when it comes to traveling about the open skies, it almost seems necessary to have some some level of structure. That way players don't feel like they are, you know, just floating in the open air, right? That's even... I've been running sessions of the game, you know, playtesting and building it out, and that's been one of the um, main difficulties that I've been working around is figuring out how exactly to help players envision where they are at in the sky in a mind's eye and how to position them with landmarks you know what can i tell them is in the area right what do the clouds look like what does the weather feel like um you know what is floating in the air around them what do they see on the ground below and uh yeah it's it's finding those landmarks that that i think is going to be useful and i do you know Please don't quote me on this, but I think I think I, I do intend to, in the final version of a game, have a, a hex-based world map that could provide a little more structure for both the storyteller and the players. Um, that would also give the world a, a, a sense of more permanence in, in a game that is literally just mostly drifting through the air. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think that kind of thing is important because in between... In between, in between places where they're where they're on ground, I believe it would be vital to make to make it that the traveling part is an essential part of the adventure. Um, I was trying to avoid it, but I may, but I can't anymore. I may as well bring up Ryutama. <laughs> just to, yeah, 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 yeah. Just in one form, especially since um, a lot of people have jokingly called that game, inclu- including myself, the Oregon Trail, as created by Miyazaki. And it, while it could, while it's very easy to to do to do some sort of narrative fast travel, it's also not. It also kind of undercuts the the open sky concept that you're going for. So I can see why that would not be advisable. Oh. Right. Yeah. You know, it's a delicate balancing act. I think a lot of times in tabletop role playing games, as uh, storytellers and dungeon masters. It's very easy for us to get caught up on the slice of lifestyle content, so much so that we forget about, you know, what what is really interesting or what we really want to be doing, right? Um, but at the same time, if you don't have that, if you don't have those moments of traveling, if it doesn't take you a while to get somewhere, or if you don't feel like there's a series of events that are necessary to to bring you to that place, then the the world might not feel quite so open. So, and it, yeah, and you know, it's like writing blurbs for this game. I've only written the word traveling the open skies uh, like a like a hundred times. So that I mean, if if that is not a feature that's highlighted, then uh, then what is? You know. Mm-hmm. And although it it's given the fact that you mentioned forbidden lands. Um, mm-hmm. I would like to pivot into another game that you, another game in that in that same family of si- of system, that I'm cu- I'm curious mm-hmm. if if um this was an influence. How familiar are you with Coriolis? Hmm. You know, I have to say, not at all. Um, not personally. The 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 games that um I've been using in part for inspiration and for structure uh, th- this game between clouds is made using the year zero engine from free league mm-hmm. um originally used for mutant year zero so that that's a rule book that i've been 
uh, really burying my nose in. And then Tales from the Loop, I've played quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And that one is a bit less, bit less number heavy, a bit, bit less stat heavy. And so that one's also been interesting to look at. But I am a stranger to Coriolis. So Coriolis is another game that's in that family of Year Zero games. Um. The best way f- the best way for me to describe Coriolis is Arabian Nights in space. Um, okay. Inclu- including the fact that ha- up to and including the fact that hackers have uh, uh, utilize utilize systems known as data gin. Mm, okay. Okay. The the theme carries throughout. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. And on y- oh. The reason why Go ahead. I, the reason why I bring up why I bring up Coriolis was when I was it's what immediately came to mind when I saw the stable and up and upgrade setup that you have within the system, and mm-hmm. what I was reminded of is the ship sheet. Try saying that five times fast. In Coriolis, yeah, right. especially given the fact that in that system. Different skills can be different skills can be utilized by different members of the crew for for um that for the action economy when it when it comes to either navigation or or um void combat. Mm-hmm. And ju- yeah, and I think realization uh, of well, it's a ship. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, I will definitely give that a look. That might that might be kind of revealing, but I think you know whether whether it be a ship or in this case, the the saddle, this like um, kind of mobile home, this basket affixed to the uh, top of a top of the party's Kieran. Um, yeah, I think I think players naturally have an inclination for base building. You know, even in games where it is not at all um, supported by the mechanics, like even just casually playing Five E, I can't tell you how many times I've had players try and. Um, try and build bases of their own or structures of their own, right? And I think being able to do that and then carry it with you, not lose any of that progress, uh, is is pretty cool. So yeah, I'll definitely check Coriolis out. As far as far as the as far as people trying to build bases and not and not having much support for that, you can bl- you can blame um Cro- you can blame Crawford for that. <laughs> oh, should I? Well, Cr- Crawford and Merles because when when stuff like that or item creation was brought was brought up, as far as why that wasn't in the core books, the mm-hmm. argument was made that they that they left. I believe it was Crawford who had said something to the extent of, "We left that blank so that players could come up with it in their own ways." I and mean, I'm not opposed to that. Content bloat is a thing, right? I guess that's one of the dangerous parts about uh, tabletop RPGs is that there's really no. Yeah, you know the, the the limit of what could be added is as far as your brain can go. Um, the hard part is, of course, the execution and, and implementation. If uh, <laughs> you know, you could you could make the most robust game. The only issue is you'd be selling rule books that were a thousand pages, right? So, we're not talking about you know, the system. It's just, <laughs> it can be done. I'm not saying it should be done, but it can be done. Um, yeah, but we're not talking about hero I, system or GURPS here. No, no. Well, GURPS is okay. GURPS can hang. I was, I was going to mention too. Uh, you know, we touched on Biopunk earlier, but just like, just a few thoughts on it. I think, I think uh, it's interesting if you give Biopunk a quick Google search and go to the images tab, you will mostly find what appears to be a cyberpunk aesthetic, but combined with you know some. Um, Fluid-filled vats and tubes, and maybe some, uh, maybe some organic components, some biological components. But I along think it, few, I think it's interesting. Along with a few screenshots from Bioshock. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, is Bioshock biopunk? I would say yes. Plasmids are a thing, but um, you know, it's, so it's, so it's interesting because the genre, unlike other things like let's say steampunk, for example, which people clearly have have carved out a pretty defined uh set of aesthetic markers for biopunk doesn't really have that and so you know at first i was a little hesitant to label this game as quote unquote biopunk but there are um you know elements in it that very much qualify and um 
I think uh, I, I think that's part of why I put it on there, because I, I felt it was the only word I really had to best describe it. It's not a science fiction game. It's not fantasy. It's not cyberpunk. It's a kind of a colorful, bizarre, post-apocalyptic um, thing focused uh, you know, fo- focused around biology, focused around these creatures that, that are changing and these people that are changing in the world, too. So um, that was the word I picked. And uh, I, I should mention, too, the the boats in the game there there are ships in the sky that can fly as one might expect and they're also flying cities known as cradles both of these the ships in the cities both are kept afloat by the hearts of kirin kirin that have been hunted and poached uh, this is what makes them so valuable is that they can keep human um vessels and settlements in the sky and away from the dangers below and so i figured having hearts a beating hearts kept in vats, pumped up with a bunch of tubing and XYZ. I think that qualified as biopunk enough at the very least, um, being a central game element and all. So, mm-hmm. um, incidentally, I did do an, I did do a image search just to see what would come up. Um, like I said, some th- some elements from Bioshock, a um, mm-hmm. a short film called Dust showed up. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of skulls for some reason. I don't know why there's so many skulls, but yeah. Um, as well as a as well as a horror game that is not out, is not out yet, but I'm keeping an eye out for called Scorn. Oh, Which... I thought I think I've seen Scorn before. I thought that might have came out, but maybe not. I could be wrong. No, they kicked the release date down not too um down the road not too long ago. Um. Uh. Yeah, happens to the best of us. I'd also I'd also say that some of some of Wayne Barlow's art could li- could lean into um lean into biopunk when he's when he's not doing when he's not doing straight up bizarre la- bizarre landscapes of his in- interpretation of hell that is. Oh sure, well hey, I can do biopunk too. Uh, yeah, there, it's it's a pretty it I it definitely needs to be explored more. Like I think like uh, Geiger. A lot of Geiger's art is kind of in that same vein too. Like, does an interesting job of combining organic and then like uh, rigid, solid elements. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and you, I, I'd say I, I say I see it a lot more when it comes to when it comes to some of the experimental SF um, art that co- that came out of came out of Europe in general and um, sweet. And Sweden in particular. Okay, um, Sweden. Hmm. Um, I don't. Sweden, hit me up. Bang my line, Sweden. Yeah, I don't. I'd also be remiss if I didn't bring up the visual styling that was. It's not full on that, and it's a bit more post-apocalyptic. But some of the art styling that was in the Genesis could also apply. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think. Uh, but bi- yeah, biopunk and like a uh, body horror also run a run a dangerous line. I think sometimes they say biopunk and people are thinking like uh, like extends right, like a Cronenberg monster, and it's like yeah, <laughs> not good, not quite. Um, so I guess maybe that maybe that's my goal then is to say that biopunk need not be quite so quite so grim, quite so dark or horrific. Not totally, you know. It could be it could be fun and colorful too. Yeah. So. Um. Whenever, whenever I need to utilize mutations in a in a positive sense, um, my go to example for my students has always been Gamma World. Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if Gamma World can get a little bit um, ridiculous, but that's sure, that's but I mean, appeal. fun still, fun nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it and it's ridiculous in in a very in a very um. A very British humor kind of what kind of way. Um, mm-hmm. I remember that the, la- the last time I was a player in a bu- in a Gamma World campaign, um, I was a I was a sentient flower wielding wielding a frid- wielding a fridge that was attached to a giant stick. Hey, I mean, you know, I, not, not to point fingers, but I. Had... I think we've all played a session of of fifth edition where we've gotten at least close to that level of absurdity. Uh, you know, someone's playing as like a uh, uh, an animated 
um wardrobe dresser kitchen table uh yep <laughs> it is it is it is possible but gamma gamma world may hold the crown for that for sure i do remember playing it i do remember playing a caster who was just a head just a floating head. oh oh sh sure yeah okay okay i'm yeah. about that yeah 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 but um and, and oh. Of course, of course, there, of course, um, there's always the there's always the legend of Los Tiburon, the the or the orc who acted like a luchador. Mm, okay, that's a character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mask and mask and all, who had the gift of being able to wrestle anything. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm okay. You know, if what what are what are tabletop games if not a chance to explore? Yeah, what would an orc luchador be like? You know, that could be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, although it did it did result in having to explain every t every time when people are like, "Aren't you going to take that thing else so you can eat?" Nope. You never. That's the thing no. about a luchador. You no. never ever ever take the mask off. But so. What yeah. I aside from. Oh, you go ahead. Go ahead. Um, what I am curious about is of all, of all the systems that you could go with, um, putting us, what what made you go with Year Zero for your system for your uh, dice roll system of choice? You know, truly, there are, and I'm going to say this has never been a truer thing ever said. Uh, there are too many tabletop role playing systems out there, and. I think I think the first question that needs to be answered is why. So for Soulbound, the last game I made an entirely original system from scratch, um, compiling inspiration from quite a few other projects. The question is why didn't I do that this time? And the answer is, I mean, in part the effort required. It's not easy. I mean, it's just rolling dice, but it it, it requires a fair deal of thought. You know, you're you're reinventing the wheel in a way, but you certainly want to make a wheel that rolls, right? So. Um, in part, I really just wanted to focus on the world building and the art and the tone for this game, um, rather than racking my head on the specifics of the numbers and so on, which I've done. And, and there will be room for that here still, but it wasn't my focus. Why I chose Year Zero in specific is because of the ways that I saw... I could repurpose some of its elements. I think I had gotten Tales from the Loop. That was one of uh, one of the games that I really buried my nose into over the last year or so. And I, um, as I was concepting for Between Clouds, the gears started turning. I think, you know, what is a very simple system in Tales from the Loop, the luck system, I've found a good way to repurpose in Between Clouds. In, in Tales from the Loop, you pick a character's age, everyone's playing as children, and the younger you are, the luckier you are. I kind of inverted that and flipped it on its head for Between Clouds, so instead, you pick how many years your character has been bonded to the Kirin, and the longer a symbiote is bonded for, the, um, the, the, the stronger their connection is, thus they have more unity points, but also the more dependent they are on the creature, thus the fewer stat points they're granted when making their character. And uh, unity points are kind of the, kind of the sauce of the game, um, being that if you roll, uh, for those who don't know, Year Zero works on sixes, uh, so a six is a success. If you don't roll any sixes, the roll fails. But um, if you roll and you fail, you can spend a unity point of yours to call the Kirin to your aid. So whether it's like pushing aside a heavy piece of rubble, um, trying to track someone down, um, charming, you know, winning over the heart of a shopkeeper, whatever it may be, you can have this creature help you out in that situation, which is just a very natural way I found through gameplay to kind of reintegrate them to the story, reintegrate them to the narrative. If the creature isn't doing much, you know, it kind of keeps them at the forefront of the action and can make for some really fun action scenes too. You know, I've had players running away from um, town guards and uh, jumping off a ledge into uh, into the into the safety of their saddle below, um, thanks to spending a unity point at the right time for the right role. So, um, 
But yeah, ultimately I chose Year Zero. To, to answer your question in short, I chose Year Zero because it is a relatively simple system. It's quite forgiving to new players. It is a playbook system. Um, so it gives people an outline, a structure to build their characters off of. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think that simplicity appealed to me in part. I definitely want this to be a, a fun game, you know, something with depth that you could play long campaigns of many multiple sessions, but also something that those who are entirely uninitiated can get into, which I, you don't have to tell me, I know is something that um, every RPG, every tabletop role-playing game seeks to do, wants to do. It's always easier said than done, but that is in part why I picked it. Also, if you don't know, uh, the Year Zero system has a great, great use of uh, buying effects is what it is. Um, in between clouds, they're called flourishes. But if you get extra successes, you can purchase these additional effects in that moment that change the outcome of what is happening. So, you know, impressing someone nearby or unveiling a hidden passage, things that will move the narrative forward in ways that they wouldn't have otherwise and have made for some really like interesting and unexpected outcomes in sessions. And I think that that I mean, that mechanic alone has uh, has has helped move the game forward quite a bit. Yeah, I'm. I'm no str I'm no stranger to Year Zero, given given the fact that I've reviewed two games in the Year Zero family on on my channel, and um, I'm looking forward to what Free League is going to do with Blade Runner. And as an aside, I'm surprised it took this long to get a Blade Runner mm -hmm. RPG. You would have think you would have thought somebody would have done this a decade ago. Uh, right. I think I couldn't be wrong. I think Free League is um uh. Has has two two hands in the uh, Lord of the Rings pot right now. I think they're working on the One Ring, but they picked. May, up... They might have two development teams though. Um, as far as as far as I'm, the One Ring RPG was originally Cubicle Seven's bag. Then, for whatever reason, the Tolkien Estate took away their license, which meant they discontinued both the One Ring, and they were working heavily towards a second edition, as well as a 5e take on Tol on Tolkien called Adventures in Middle Earth, which I think won I think won an Origins Award the year that it came out. And I don't know what no I don't know what's happened with Adventures in Middle Earth. That's been in limbo. But um, to but the One Ring is be is being handled is was well, the second edition of that was handled by Free League, um, which isn't right. using their Year Zero engine. The other thing that they're doing that isn't using their Year Zero engine is a revival of Twilight 2000. Ah, uh, I saw that as well. Yeah, they. I mean, they've definitely they've definitely branched out and uh, made a name for themselves in that regard. Yeah, mm -hmm. which. Is not, is cert was certainly not on my bingo card list of things I'd I'd expect to see come back. And well, when it came to the Alien RPG, I was just glad I was able to play an Alien RPG without having to break out the last time somebody tried it. That being mm. the Aliens Adventure game, which has been my whipping boy, and I've frequently said I'm not running that unless I get paid. <laughs> you know, I think I had I think I had a. Uh... I'm trying to remember a rule book, an expansion, or a supplement for that. I bought an absolutely ab absurd um, quantity of tabletop role-playing supplements and booklets from my local game store when I was younger. Mm -hmm. The the worker there did not know what he was doing. He was trying to get rid of inventory, and he said, I'll, t I'll sell you the whole top shelf for $100. <laughs> Everything up there, we don't need it. we got to get rid of it. 100 bucks. And on the receipt, it said I had a 96% discount. True story. <laughs> and uh, that worker did not stick around for long. That was a poor choice on his part. But it meant that I wound up with a um, pretty pretty sizable estate worth of, uh, you know, archa uh, archaic, outdated relics of tabletop RPGs from days past. And I think I might, think I might have had a couple of alien books in there. Yeah. Um, the big reason that I... Other I'm notable... Oh, go, go, go. The big reason that I wouldn't run it is it uses the same rule set as Phoenix Command, which is um, incessantly crunchy. Mm. 
Yeah, crunch has its time and place. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, you know, the one other reason that I picked the Year Zero engine is because they are pretty, they're pretty forgiving with that. And there are many systems out there that will let you hack them. I actually almost used Powered by the Apocalypse initially. Um, but there was something about the moves in Powered by the Apocalypse that I just couldn't quite... Um, to, me, to me, it wasn't just the right fit, necessarily. Uh, I know it does work well for some people, um, and it is very forgiving for new players, but just getting the moves to work quite the way I wanted to wasn't happening. So, pre-league, uh, so year zero it was. And I love D6s. I, I, you know, I don't mind a D20 system, but if I could have players get everything they need from their local game store in one little box of dice, um, or, you know, even people most commonly have D6s lying around. If, if you're not a tabletop gamer, you may not have a, a dodecahedron. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a sucker for a D6 system, so... Um. And with now, when it comes to the role system that you that you have, which is not too far removed from a lot from the archetypes in other year Z- year zero games, would these be more of would roles still be a kind of starting template? Yeah, they the structure. It's not like they have a a, a progression to work through they the rules serve almost entirely as a starting template i mean they do define who the character is and um you know how how their starting skills and base stats can be assigned so it it does affect who the character is and how they will function as part of the group but it certainly doesn't determine who they can become you know they can build themselves as they please through uh, through the gameplay um the main thing that the roles are responsible for, there's there's a few tweaks that I've made um, from something like Mutant or Tales from the Loop. There is a relationship category, I believe, present in one of those games. Relation to, I think in Tales from the Loop, it's relation to the other kids. I spun that in a purely negative context and said, what if we did drama instead, you know? The players are meant to function as a found family, and all families have drama. I, I really like the idea of having players aligned with a, a shared goal, a shared objective. Let's say, um, you know, rescuing a, a wild Kieran for the most common example. But then having internal forces that they need to fight as well. Things that are things that are pulling them apart. You know, like uh, this this person, the scoundrel of the group, never wants to listen to my orders, or the brawler is always running in first, or the captain is way too bossy, right? And even having a um, a little boon uh, for players who overcome that drama in game. So that is in part determined by the role. There's also um, items are common in uh, items are a feature in Year Zero games because I'm really fixated on how how stylish and poised and elegant these symbiotes should be. Um, and eccentric they should be, I'm recontextualizing the idea of items in the game as uh, fashion or accessories. Not quite settled on a word yet, but the idea is that rather than being an item that you could carry or store, it'd be an item that is worn. So rather than finding climbing tools, you would find, let's say, a climbing belt, for example. Or rather than having a sword in your inventory, the sword is more contextualized as a piece of um, an accessory on your hip. Look, you know, look at this. Look at this bejeweled, the dazzling, ornate thing. It's the first thing you notice when you see a person. So, I'm finding ways to, for each of the roles, um, kind of to to recontextualize what the specific categories are that the roles contribute to a character, and then also finding ways to kind of build out the world, let it known what what could be possible through the roles. Um, they are in order: captain, brawler, fisher, scoundrel mechanic and jester with a wayfinder a duelist and an apothecary to be added via stretch goals because i'm you know i'm a little lazy i can't it, ta- it takes a while to make a roll i gotta do all the art and everything else so um so even just given what the roles are and then what players will start with from them i'm hoping that will add kind of flavor to the characters and an idea of who people are or could be in the context in the world of between clouds What 
you shooting for as far as the launch date when it comes to the Kickstarter for the project? Uh, so the Kickstarter is going to be launching on March 21st at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2022. Um, and I, uh, you actually can uh, take a, a sneak peek, a little look behind the scenes at the Kickstarter draft that I've shared. I think I've um, linked it in whole, and I, I imagine it should be linked in this video, or if not, uh, easy to find elsewhere. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the, it is not the pre-launch page, but I've, I'm trying to make the draft available to people because I really want them to see, to read what it's all about, you know, to have this information available to them even before the Kickstarter does launch. But uh, March 21st is the day, which I believe is only 19 days away now and for some hours. But uh, who's counting? So Me. That's be that's, and that's because I that's because I count everything. <laughs> oh. the, and and me and also the bot I've set up on the there is a Discord server as well. And if anyone is interested, I highly implore you to join the Discord. I'll be dropping frequent updates there and discussing details about the game. So, mm -hmm. well, with the, I certainly am going to be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to return to my temple here and enjoy the madness that happens here every day. Mildred, I am honored to have been in such a, a venerated place, mm -hmm. um, a revered place. Thank you for having me, as always. It's a huge pleasure. And, of course, anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to delve further into Between Clouds or to... La or to laugh at the person who decided to um, pl decided to play a r decided to play a ranger for the umpteenth time. Um, the door is always open. As mm -hmm. I say around yeah, here, I have thoughts, words, and ideas about rangers. <laughs> drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>